Today's date is 26 July 2023. I'm Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience. I'm out here at the tank farm. And I've got the pleasure of sitting down and speaking with James Hanrahan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. Appreciate right. it. If you could just give me a little bit of background on who you are. Where were you born? Where did okay. you grow up, go to school, that kind of thing? Okay, I was born in the city of Chicago on the south side. I went to grammar school at Holy Cross Grammar School on the south side. And then uh, I went to uh, Mundelein, or it's actually known as uh, Cathedral High School on the north side on Chicago Avenue. Uh, shortly after getting, graduating from there, I went to work in downtown Chicago at a medical advertising company. And then I w really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I joined the Navy. And I joined the Navy on the 22nd, and uh, well, I departed for the Navy on the 22nd of February, 1959. And went, uh, instead of like, even though I'm born and raised in Chicago, instead of going to Great Lakes, I was one of the only few that was sent to San Diego for RTC. And following that, I went to hospital corps school at uh, San Diego, graduated from there in September 59, and then was sent to the Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California for duty at the hospital and TAD once in a while with the Marines to support them. And in 1960, September of 61, I was sent to the Field Medical Service School to learn how to be a combat Marine medic as a HM3. And then from there, I went to the 3rd Battalion, 4th Marine, 1st Marine Brigade, 3rd Marine Division in Hawaii at Kaneohe. It was just coming out of cadre, so we had to build her up. And I stayed with them from 61 to 64. 64, I, I went to the Naval Hospital San Diego uh, Administrative Training School. Graduated from there and went to the Naval Hospital uh, San Diego for duty. Uh, worked in the personnel admin. Following that, I went to duty with the 2nd Marine Division, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I was there for two years. And then I got orders to the 1st Marine Division, Vietnam, uh, Da Nang, as they went there. Served in the 1st Marine Division there for um, July 69 to February 70 when I got commissioned and I went back to Bethesda, Maryland. You want me to keep going? Well, let me stop you real quick. Okay. It, um, did you have any other family members that were military? My father was in World War I with the Army. My brother was in World War II with the Army. My brother was in Korea with uh, the Navy. Okay. Uh, I, I come from a family of 12. I'm one of, I'm the eighth of 12. Gotcha. Okay. And I had six brothers and five sisters. So you said you didn't really know what you wanted to do, so you joined No, the when, I got, when I graduated from high school, I had a, a scholarship to Loyola University, and I had a scholarship uh, acceptance at DePaul. I thought about being a doctor, but one, I couldn't afford college, so I went to work, and I had to help support my family. So yeah. I went to work, and uh, while I was at work, I was never, I liked what I was doing. But I just never was fulfilled and told my wife, I said, you know, I really want to, I want to go, I want to go in the Navy. And she said, you've been talking about going to the Navy ever since we went to school together. I said, yep. She said, why don't you do it? So I did it. Why the Navy? Well, I, to tell you the truth, I, I used to watch a lot of movies and I'd see those guys on the aircraft carriers. And I wanted to be an aviation bosun's mate. And in fact, when I joined the Navy, I, when I got to San Diego, I was, you know, I was going to be an aviation boatswain's mate. Well, about two-thirds through boot camp, when you take all those to test, I get told by this nice, friendly chief petty officer, said, you're going to be a hospital corpsman. I said, no, I'm not. I don't want to be a goddamn corpsman. He said, yeah, you do. I said, no, I don't. The next thing you know, I'm going to quarry school. He said, you, you know, you, you don't have a choice. You're in, in the Navy now. So I went to core school. I enjoyed it. How long is that school? Uh, at that time, it was 16 weeks. 16 weeks, okay. So you get to Vietnam in 1969. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your first impressions when you get there? It's hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, we landed at a, a 15th aerial port in Da Nang and drove by truck up to Freedom Hill. And when you got there, you know, like I said, the thing that really hit you more than anything else was the smell. They, uh, you know, mainly it was... They were burning off all the 
the crappers and that smell was always hanging in the air when you got to the I got there and you know they said okay uh, you're going to go to work as a in the division surgeon's office so I went up there I got sent to the division surgeon's office and I worked out of there I was the uh, medical admin support for the first marine division so what I did is I, I would support all the units of the first marine division I had a set of travel orders gave me permission to go travel by military aircraft from DMZ all the way down to the other side of July so I would visit all the units there which would you know make sure the admin was good uh, tests were taken care of and medical supplies and things like that and then uh, about a month and a half later I was the detail chief for the first marine division corpsman and I used to detail all the corpsmen the, the various units and they I would meet them at the reception center and then assign them to the various units within the first marine division okay. what is the what is the duties of a, of a navy corpsman the actual corpsman yeah. uh, when when we're in the field with the marines we're we're their medical support we're everything they got everything a marine needs we got it we take care of it from scratching his toenail to being shot and uh, we provide all that total range of care uh, in fact, everything a Marine does, the corpsman does too, sometimes better. Right. You know. So would they carry, carry a rifle? And no, I, well, you know, according to the Geneva Convention, they're not supposed, they're supposed to be unarmed. Right. Well, during World War II, the uh, Marines found out very quickly that, one, the guys that were dressed different than them, mainly the Navy, the corpsman in those days used to wear the Navy dungaree uniform. The Japanese figured out they must be more important, so they were shooting them more than they were the Marines. So the corpsman, they dressed the corpsman as a Marine, and they, you know, I was armed with a 45 automatic, and that, that was my TO weapon was a 45, but uh, I drew a 12 gauge shotgun too. I used to carry when I go out in the field, I had a 12 gauge shotgun that I carry with me for close in work if I somebody attacked a Jeep or draw it because when you're driving down some of the roads people do you know uh, you know, didn't know who were VC and who weren't yeah. and in fact a couple of times I treated a, a casually you know put bandages on them in the morning and they found them that night in the wire so you know what he was right. but a corpsman uh, provides all the medical support to a marine you know whatever they need and you know you stay with them and do whatever the marine does you do how many corpsmen would be assigned to, to a company? A Marine Corps rifle company, you usually would have five, four or five corpsmen. Okay. You'd have a third class senior corpsman, which I was uh, H when I was at HM3, I was a senior corpsman. And then you'd have one for each platoon. Okay. And you had the platoon corpsmen. You eat, sleep, and live with the Marines, or whatever the Marines do. But the one thing you can say about the Marines is that they take care of their corpsmen. When I was out in the line, I never worried about my back because there was always a Marine, they're watching it. And they always took care of the corpsmen. Yeah. So what are your primary duties of your first tour in Vietnam? My primary duties was, when I first got there, was I was a chief. Right. And I, my duties was, you know, uh, providing uh, administrative and medical support to the various units. And what would do is, like, give you an example, is I would leave, I would go out to Anwa, where the 5th Marines was, and I'd go out and visit with the various corpsmen, make sure everything was okay, they need medical supplies, did they need anything, and I'd provide, make sure they got them. If they, like when the exam period came up, I made sure that we were, they were able to take the advancement exams that, so they could get advanced. Even though it, there was a waiver in it at that time, there were still people that had to take the exam. Yeah. And then uh, after that, I was the guy who sent the corpsman to each unit. I'd go out to the unit, visit people, the corpsman, if I'd see a corpsman, you know, was there and he'd been there for about six months. I'd rotate him back to medical battalion or the first hospital company and put a new one in. Okay. And if one got killed, I had to replace him. Doctor got killed, I had to replace him. Okay. Did you ever go out in the field? Often. Uh, often. Yep. I was in the field uh, with the Marines at, at various areas, uh, most uh, at least once a week. Because yeah. you can't tell what's going on unless right. you go there. So what's that like? Most people will never experience combat. Yep. What, what is it like the first time that you're finally, you know, all this training, you've been in the Navy for several yep. years, yep. now you're in Vietnam, you read about it, 
heard about it, watched it. You want to know? Now you're there. The first night I got in Vietnam, I was, I was standing outside the, the hooch where I slept, and there was me and a couple of other corpsmen there, then talking, and all of a sudden I heard this sound. I went, what, what the hell? And all of a sudden they're diving on the ground. I'm standing looking around. I went, what? And guess what? That missile hit the side of the hill above us, and needless to say, I was under them. That was my, right. you know, I was just as scared as the day as they were. But it's a scary thing because yeah. the bad part about it was you never knew who was on your side and who wasn't. You know, uh, we had corpsmen that were killed by people they were taken care of. And like I said, <clears throat> it was nothing to take care of a cat, people during the day and have them come back that night trying to kill you. And that's not just the corpsmen, that's the Marines. So you never really knew, you know, who was who was the good guys because they all looked alike. Yeah. And there was, you know, there was people that you know I dealt with that were actually Viet Cong, but they didn't, you know, to me they were just wounded, sick Vietnamese. Right. So you're treating anybody that needs anybody that came up that needed. Our guys are priority, but if there's anybody, else. our guys get taken care of first, yeah. But then if they, you know, like. Uh, the woman that used to, the, the hooch, the lady that used to clean, you know, our laundry and everything. She had a couple of kids and, you know, they, they had real bad worms and everything. And, you know, I dewormed them for her and everything else. But, uh, you know, she was okay. But because I tested her one day because I, I wanted to see, you know, what they do. So I got up and I left my 45 laying on my bunk. And I went to the head and came back. And it wasn't there. And I looked around and I thought, uh-huh. You know, because they'd steal. But she had to come in after me, picked up my pillow and slipped it under my pillow. So, and she chewed me out for leaving it there. <laughs> you no know, Levy, no Levy, no no good, VC steal. Right. So. Yeah. But I mean, that, you know, it was just, a, you never really knew, you know, what, what it was. But, you know, once you got there, it's just life. You just lived, you, you know. You were scared, yeah. What are living conditions like? Well, uh, mine were a little bit better probably than some of the others because we, you know, I was stationed back at the headquarters. But uh, the living conditions out there, you know, were, you know, I had a bunk. I ate in the mess hall. Had, you know, five in one room, sea rats. When I went in the field, I ate sea rats with the troops, ate everything they ate. And the living conditions, you know, it wasn't like living at the Holiday Inn. But, uh, I mean, you know, you don't have any, a big thing to get a shower hot water. We had an old, uh, let's see, with the arm, a few, well, you guys used to call them fuel, extended fuel tanks, had one that we put up on top of the shower and put water in it and heated it up and you at least took the chill off of it. And that was the best going. You get a nice shower once in a while. Okay. When you're in the field, how long are you out there? Well, day or? well I, it depends on what, what yeah. you know, like if I went down, to, when I went to July, I was down there for three or four days. I, I went up to the Quantria, I was up there for a couple of days. Normally, uh, the areas around the Nang, I could do in a day. I mean, like you go out to drive uh, to, out to, to the, what we used to call the sand spit, where the first Marines were. You could drive that in a half hour, 45 minutes, and you know, go out there. Or to go to Anwa, I'd catch Mission 46 with a, a CH-53 helicopter, and I'd fly out in the morning, fly back at night. downtime did you have any downtime and what did you do to occupy yourself well i would read write letters you know do the usual you know we had a, sometimes we play volleyball but uh you know downtime you know when it got dark you didn't go wandering around yeah. mainly because there were marines running around with rifles and there were bad guys running around with rifles yeah uh you're married at the time mm -hmm. had kids i'm assuming had two kids boy and a girl how do they adjust to you being gone in combat? Well, my son, you know, let's see, that was, he was, uh, he was only about four or five, so he wasn't, and my daughter was only about two, so. Okay. But my uh, my wife would, you know, was the one that would really, uh, you know, she knew about it. And whenever we could, you know, I'd go up to the, the Mars station, had a going thing with a, got, uh, he was an army sergeant up there in it, and he, I could go up there about once a month and call home. And they'd call North Island, North Island would call my wife, and then we could talk. For, 
she'd hear it, you know, I was okay. But, you know, often she'd hear something like, you know, Da Nang was hit or the, the Marines were around where I was were hit by missiles. And she never knew for sure, you know, she, didn't, she lived, you know, in terror of that. She know where you were specifically. Oh yeah. Yeah. So when she saw that on the news. Yeah, oh, yeah. She knew you were there. Yeah. yeah it wasn't classified where I was. Right. I mean, you know, we had 15th aerial was right about two miles away and uh, down there. Describe what you talked about Mars. What, how does that work? That's not just a phone call. That's well, no, what it is is it's a radio yeah. system. You go up to. We had a radio system set up. It was a, it's just communications guy. You know, radio system. And what he would do is he would get on and send them call, get radio signal in the uh, North Island, which is in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And when he got to San Diego, the guy would call my wife and it hooked me up. And then of course I would talk to her and. To, then I'd have to say over, and she'd have to say over. But at least she heard my voice. Right. Okay. So it's a radio call. It's a radio call. Yeah. No, it's a radio call. So yeah. it's a, it's, it's a radio call. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, uh, what do you remember most about your first tour? What's the one thing that sticks out? Well, that, hmm. I don't know. To describe just one thing, you know, it's it was a, it's an everyday thing. So, everyday. yeah. I think you you know one but one thing that took was uh, the, our ability to get down and get, like you asked about downtime. Some Sundays we would be able to go down to China Beach, and go swimming. That was good. We would take a bunch of the corpsmen from the various city. We'd get a six by and fill them up, and drive down there and have a barbecue and swim for the afternoon. Which was a good break for them. Now, you know, you're familiar with the Da Nang area mm -hmm. and Freedom Hill? Okay, you know that there was 1st Medical Battalion and then there was 1st Hospital Company and then up on top of Freedom Hill was there. And the thing I remember was just, you know, going around, seeing the people. How did the your interactions with the Vietnamese, how, how, how were they receiving the Americans? Were they happy you were well, there? Or yeah, they, most, of, most of them were happy we were helping them. And like I said, you know, we have a, you know, most of the, the people that were around the camp, you got to know them. And uh, like when guys would go on R&R, &R, they'd bring back an umbrella, a big umbrella, because over there, their umbrellas weren't that well built, but they're really good umbrella and they bring them back and you know for as a gift and they were appreciative and like i said uh when her kids were sick they she'd bring them in the sick bay into the area and we'd take them down there and clean them up and fix you know they need bandages or something like that we bandage them and you know but uh when you the thing is you're out there when you see the people you see people that don't have nothing and you do something for somebody who has nothing and they're very grateful but again like i said you know the kids and the, the, the women were okay. The guys, you know, you never knew if he was a VC or not. So your wife, you talk about your wife, you know, she's watching the news and she sees the She wouldn't watch the news. She wouldn't. Okay. She, she said she wouldn't watch wouldn't the news. Because, you know, and people would call her and say, hey, did you hear about what, what the 1st Marine Division? Did you hear what happened up at the Nang? And she said, I don't want to hear it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and one day she said, she remembered that she was coming home and she drove, drove up to the house, parked the car, and all of a sudden an, uh, an official Navy car was coming up the road right behind her. And he came right by our house and then went past. She said that really shocked her. Yeah. Because that usually meant they were That's really, that's how they, make, they were making that. No. Yeah. Were you guys aware of what was going on in America? You know, that's a very... Oh, yeah, we got... That's we got, the height of the protest. No, we got, we, got, we got newscasts and yeah. everything else. I mean, we weren't totally isolated from right. it. We got newspaper. We had... We got Stars and Stripes and, yeah. and other... And we knew about it, you know. You didn't really know how bad it was till you got home. Yeah. And like I said, when I came home from Vietnam and, you know, uh, I got greeted at the airport by, you know, and I couldn't do anything about it. And then when I was going to school, you know... Uh, I would walk down the street in Bethesda, Maryland. There'd be guys running around with Viet Cong shirts and and making you know and and you know you just wanted to reach in and strangle them, but you couldn't. Yeah. 
Does that have any effect on you guys over there? No one about the negative. No, because we were there? too busy taking care of the business over there, and we didn't, you know, it really didn't. We didn't care about. Were we happy about it? No. Yeah. But I mean, there was guys over there, you know, that you know bothered you. I'm sure it bothered other people, but me, I just you know wrote it off as you know a bunch of idiots. You know, I wanted to punch a few of them out, but right. like I got reminded by a very friendly lieutenant commander told me, you're, you're an officer now and you can't do that. <laughs> because there was one guy who was going to put his head between the bars at the White House, but, you know, in the fence there. Mm -hmm. he was. I was walking by and he grabbed me and pulled me over there and started waving the Viet Cong flag at me and I was going to hurt him badly. <laughs> but I didn't. Yeah. It, you know, it hurt. So you come back after a year, and eventually you, you get your commission. I was commissioned. Yeah. Okay. And then you go back to Vietnam. What no, I went. Uh, I went from there to Naval Hospital Jacksonville. Okay. For two years, and then I I got orders to the Kitty Hawk. Okay. And she was uh, on Yankee Station. And that was going being on an aircraft carrier, and being on the ground is 180 out. Okay. But uh, you know we were on Yankee Station. We go on, we come into Subic Bay for about four days to refit, rearm, and then go back on Yankee Station for 30 to 60 days. What is, what is when you were, say, Yankee Station? When you Yankee Station was a, spe a specific area in the Gulf of Tonkin okay. where aircraft carriers would go in during the day. They would <clears throat> bomb day and night in, the, in, the, in Vietnam. Okay. But it was called Yankee Station. So I guess you got your your wish. You did you did make it to an aircraft carrier. I did get the air. In fact, <laughs> once I was on the aircraft carrier and I saw the work those guys did, I was grateful. I was I I never made it. Yeah. Because being an aviation boatswain's mate or being on the deck of an aircraft carrier is the most dangerous job in the world. Right. I mean it. You know they they work constantly, moving those airplanes around, watching those planes land. And, you know you you in those days you look up and there's a plane coming at you. 125 miles an hour drop it onto your deck right. and you got to run and get out of the way yeah so what are your duties when you're on the aircraft carrier? i was the medical admin officer okay i oh, in fact i was the division officer i ran the medical department for the the whole ship right wow. and then i was the medical admin officer for ctf 77 which is the carrier task force okay. what are What's a day-to-day -day life like on an aircraft carrier deployed? Well, you just, let's see. You get, I used to get up about 5.30 in the morning, go down to sick bay, check out. We'd hold sick call. And then I'd go around and you know, do my, my, my job, uh, admin work, check, check my corpsman, do, you know, go through all the work we do. After sick call was over, I'd, you know, you could go kind of relax, you know, have lunch. Mm -hmm. And then after lunch, I would... I used to made myself for the first, which was really funny, is the first 30 days I was aboard that ship, I never went outside. Okay. So then after that, I started making myself, during down periods when the aircraft isn't there, aren't there, it walk around the flight deck. Just keep walk around, for, get fresh air and sunshine. Yeah. But the first, you know, I just never had any reason to go outside. Because where I sat at my desk, I had a TV here and a TV there. I could monitor what was going on in the flight deck. And see, we had Corman up on the flight deck, too, so okay. I had to monitor that. That's interesting. So they're there just in case. They're there, they're there all they're every day. They're there, they're flight deck Corman, and they respond to crashes or anything else. Yeah. Anybody get hurt? Okay. Anything like that happen when <clears> you were on board? Yeah, it's, but I don't want to talk about it. It had oh. a few uglies. Yeah. So, life on an aircraft carrier, it's all self, self-sustaining, right? You've got everything you, you need right there. Right there. It's like a small city, uh, floating city. Yep. How, how, many, how many men are assigned to, to Depending that? on the configuration of the carrier, you'd be anywhere from 5,000 to 7,000. Yeah. Do, I mean, that's a lot of people to cram into a, a relatively small spot. Yep. Or small space. Carrier is not small. Not small, but when you have that many people. Oh yeah, but they yeah. they, they have 
jobs and different jobs and everything right. else. Right. But they they work 24 hours a day. Yeah. And like I said, we bombed day and night. So you have a crew in the morning, a crew in the afternoon. Right. So they're launching and recovering. Constantly. Launching, loading, launching, and recovery. How is life for you different between being enlisted and now being commissioned? How do, what if, well, how do things change? Well, it changed. You know, your whole your whole life has changed. You know, when when you were on this side of the coin, you were taking orders. On this side of the coin, you were giving orders. On this side of the coin, you were responsible for this little section, and on this side of the coin, you were responsible for all of it. So yeah, it's a it's a difference of responsibility, and you know. Knowledge. Right. Was there, looking back on it, did you enjoy being an officer more than you did enlisted, or was it just different? You know, hard to say which one it's, you enjoyed it, more. You know. Right. There are two different, I, I like, let's just put it this way, I like the pension as an officer. <laughs> right. Right. But no, I, the, the jobs I had as an officer were, were much more uh, fulfilling than I did, right. you know. Because I, I mean, I, I did things as an officer that I wouldn't have done on as an enlisted man. I mean, I served on all of the, the major staffs. Yeah. Downtime on a carrier. What is there for recreation? Name other it. Other than walking around the deck. Name it. You Anything. got you got movies. You got TV. You got books. You got. I I went to college on on the carrier. I got. Uh, I went to Chapman College and got. Uh, three, four courses that account for my degree. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, there's things to do at night. I mean, when you, and then you, they sleep. But, I mean, those people on the, the flight deck, they're 12 on, 12 off. And let me tell you, the guy goes here, he eats and goes to bed. He gets up, goes back and does that. Gets up, goes to bed. That's why when you go in, in the port for a five-day period, people would say, you know, they're wild. Well, you're, you're damn right. They had to unwind. And when you stand, you do that for 30, 30, 45 days at a time, 60 days, it, you get, you know, you come in and when you get a couple of months pay in your pocket and Subic Bay or Hong Kong or anywhere else, it was great. Right. Did you have a favorite port of call? Mm, Singapore. Singapore? Yeah, Singapore was very interesting. Well, you get it, one. It's old, and you had a lot of history and a lot of different things going on. You could do it there. You know, like, you know, I went to saw a jade being processed, jade mine. You got to see jewelry being made. You got you know, a culture. Then, it, you know, Singapore was a British colony, so you got a lot of British things going on there, right. and a lot of museums that you got to go to. Yeah. How, how long? You, how often do you do, would you do something like that? What? Go, go, uh, go to a port like that and, and mm -hmm. take a break from it. It all depends. Well. It depends on what the schedule calls for. Yeah. I mean, if the you know, schedule calls for you to stay, but uh, usually about, <clears throat> you go a couple of months. A couple of months. Okay. And you're, so you're, when you're deployed this time, is it still a year or, or is it? No, it was 13 months. 13 months. Yep. And that's typical of, of a deployment like that? In Vietnam. Board well, board ship? Yeah. No, deployment. Board ship is, uh, usually it's a normal cruise is about nine, eight, six to eight months. Now, we we got out there and one of the ships broke down. And we had to stay on the line longer, you know, uh, and got that, you know, on the line on that. Right. So we had to stay on the line until that ship could get in there. We used to call it the Stranger Ranger. Right. Where's the stranger right here today? Yeah. yeah. Was there a lot less stress being on board, for you anyway, for being on a carrier than there was when you're actually on, on the ground in Vietnam? Yeah, because I knew who was, you yeah, know. Who the bad guys were. I knew who the there were no bad guys. There weren't any. Yeah. And, you know, you had a normal routine, whereas in country, you, had, you, you know, you'd be in bed, all of a sudden you hear the alarms go off and you hit right. head for a. Reacting, to reacting you know, you don't really get to, you know, sleep that well. You, yeah. you you sleep, but you don't sleep that well. Yeah. I mean, your mind is just ready to get up and go. Right. How about your wife? How, how was her attitude a little 
little different. I mean, she knew this, right? She well, okay. You'd much rather have you on an aircraft carrier. Oh yeah, well yeah, but you, she knew I was safer on the aircraft yeah. carrier. Although we had accidents on the aircraft yeah, carrier, oh, yeah. but but she she knew, and you know, it was more of a stable. She didn't like me being gone for you know six or eight months at a time, but she liked that. You know, it's better than knowing that I'm in the dirt and out in the mud, and there's people shooting at me. Now, they shoot at me on the aircraft carrier, it take a long time to get to me. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, so, how, how you come back after 13 months, and and then what? The off the carrier. Off the carrier? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're Eight, going 13 months? No, you, the normal cruise on the carrier, 13 months, I thought you meant in country tour for ground. No. Okay. The aircraft carrier usually cruises six to eight months. Six to eight months, okay. And you, after that, you come home, and then you, you go into a, probably a, a refit, and because at that time, they would turn the carriers around pretty quick. Right. So you go into a refit, and then, uh, like, in our case, we came back from Vietnam, in November of 72 and let's see we came back and then we we were home for about uh, three and a half four weeks and then we went to Hunter's Point up in San Francisco to be refitted with uh, for new JBDs and all that kind of stuff. What, what year is this that you're on the, car on the Kitty Hawk? I was on the Kitty Hawk from 72 to 74 July July 72 to June of 74. And your deployment was in July in 72? 72. Yeah. I joined the Kitty Hawk in 72 on the on the gun line. Yeah. Okay. I flew into the ASU which was the air, aircraft support unit there at Da Nang which you know going in in 72 compared to what it was like in 70 it was night and a little bit night and day because we were drawn down a lot of the Marines were gone the Vietnamese were taken over and you know I didn't sleep well that night, let's put it that way, because there were no Marines around. 15th Aerial was pretty much covered, you know, the area we were in was pretty much covered by the local Arvin, the Arvin aircraft, no, that's not aircraft, Arvin is the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Vietnamese soldiers. There were just, you know, like I say, some of them were fabulous, some of them were just weren't that good. And this is in 72? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we, we, like I said, I stayed there overnight until the aircraft, they, they sent a cot off to, from the aircraft carrier, came out and picked me up and took me out to the aircraft carrier. I got my first catch. Really? Okay. What's yep. that like? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> you, the first time I saw the what, ship. What aircraft are you aboard? Huh? What aircraft? Uh, it was the uh, cod. Cod, okay. And we were out to see one and we were out flying from Vietnam out into the Yankee Station and the pilot turned to me and said look down there doc yeah you see that little dot yeah that's your ship that's our ship I said that little dot you could put this big airplane on that little dot he said yep and he flew down and when he got down to it it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then you know he came down and he said we're going in <laughs> boom and you you were sitting there and you, you hit the deck just your big jerk, and that was the hook, tail hook catching. And then there's a little sigh of relief, I'm sure. Cause well, the, stopped the you stopped and everything, and then you, you know the bad part is you get off. You got your suitcase and your your, your stuff, and you get off, and you yeah, you just look. At what's going to happen next? Right. But they they had a corpsman that my chief was there to meet me and show me to go down. You know where to go. Because I had no idea where on the aircraft carrier where to go, and you know we walked into the island straight down one deck and forward, and there it was medical. Wow. You mentioned uh, you briefly touched about the, the 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 Vietnamese soldiers when when you were with the the Marines your first time. Were there Vietnamese embedded in those units, or there's all there's areas? some they're they're around the area. Some of them are around the area. There weren't actually. I didn't see them exactly embedded in at the units, yeah. but they were there. But I mean, you, you, they're out there, and you know, like I say, they're fighting the same. Yeah, but they were more down south than we were up north. Gotcha. Okay. Did 
the interactions that you did have with them, what kind of soldiers were they? I mean, it's their country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you a humorous story. Was uh, when I got when I went in to draw my weapon. Uh, you know, I always wanted the M2 carbine, and I told the old Gunny, I said, "Hey, Gunny, I, said, I see them carbines over there." One, I said, "I said, how about me draw one of those?" He said, "Doc, you don't want one of those." I said, "Why?" He said, "You don't want one of those." I said, "Why?" He said, "Look around a couple of days and come back, and you'll know." I said, "Okay." Well, it turned out to be most of the carbines were, were being carried by the Arvins, and when they fired those carbines, they drew fire. The VC could tell the difference between yeah. M16 and that car B. They knew they had an Arvin. Right. Okay. So I, he said, now you know why, right, Doc? Right, my 45 is good. <laughs> well, that's good. He's looking out for you. <laughs> yeah. You don't want one, Doc. I said, sure. I'm, he said, you don't. Then he said, because for some reason, the Viet Cong hear that car B and they want to shoot at it. Hmm. More so than the M16, huh? Mm hmm. It was interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, do you ever keep in touch with any of the guys that you that you serve with over there? Uh, well, a lot of them are gone now. Right. But uh, yeah. But as the years progress, did you? Was I I, I stay. Like yeah, or? we you know the same people I I worked with and everything else. You know, one thing about being the corpsman and being a uh, MSC Medical Service Corps is. It's a small family, and we're all we all cross each other's path back and forth, and you know. So you see, uh, you have a guy you had here would be, you know, maybe uh, ten years later you see him over here, you know, in, in, at a hospital or a dispensary, and you know, I had to, like one of the guys that served with me in in uh, Da Nang worked for me again in Philadelphia. So I mean, it's just a. A matter of you know, it's a small family. Yeah. Did you, we wrote each other and kept track? But you know, after a while, you know, you, they, you just we lose you lose contact. Yeah. But you run into them again. Like I said, uh, in fact, it was uh, one of the guys that was with me. And let's see, Bob Kintz was Bob was a second class. We were in Hawaii together in the First Marine Brigade. And when my son went through boot camp, the guy checking his hearing. My son said his name and. He said, no, that's not your name. He said, no, it's not. He said, no. He said, your name is James Hanran Jr. My son said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, because I know your daddy. And that's, <laughs> and that's a, you know, that, that's, that's kind of happens. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Looking back on your, your time, especially your wartime uh, uh, service, how, how do you think that shaped who you became? Hmm. I don't know. Just... To help me do what I be what I am, you know. I always reflected on it. Would I do it again? Yeah. Did I believe? Yeah. We were right in what we were doing. Uh, but you know, it made you know. I grew up. I let's say I was a better man for it. Yeah. Imagine you know being in combat is something that you know no one goes in and comes out the same. I imagine. Mm-mm. -mm. Like the the guy who was best man at my wedding, he was killed in July. You know, and I always remember him. One of the reasons that we do this is so we can preserve your story. Somebody mm -hmm. fifty or a hundred years might see this. Who knows? Family hey. member, or stranger. I mean, you what know. Would you like to know about your service? What would I? What? What would you like them to know about your service? I, I served 37 years and enjoyed every bit of it. It helped me and, you know, it's great life. Advice you give them? I advise any person saying uh, Today's young person, just like I had, I was at, where was I at the other, a couple of days ago, I was sitting there and a young kid was asking, you know, he saw my hat and he said, you wouldn't, I said, yep. Yeah. He said, what's it like to go in the middle? So we talked. And I said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? He said, I don't know. I said, well, what do you, he said, I'm a senior in high school, I'll graduate. And he was going to graduate in June. He said, I said, well, what are you going to for college? I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. I said, did you ever think about going in the military? He said, well, I thought about it, but who wants to be a, you know, I said, hey, you know, the military, when I went in the military, I was a high school graduate. I said, I had 
I, I was just graduated from high school, didn't have anything else for you. Now, I hold two degrees. I said, I've gone, been all over the world. I said, and all that the Navy did. He said, well, I said, you ever think the Navy will do, and if you don't stay in the Navy, just go stay one enlistment. You got all that GI Bill, uh, education and benefits, you do it. He said, you know, I hadn't thought about that. So maybe he does. Yeah. But I don't think the service ever hurt anybody. Good advice. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? We no. Can, I'm, we can cover. <laughs> I, I hope I, I hope this, you know, was good. It was. It was. Yeah. Well, on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Experience, thank you, sir, again thank for you. sitting down and talking to us. Well, glad to. Uh, thank you for your service. It's, thank uh, you. It is uh, greatly appreciated. Like you said, no one ever, no one ever got hurt from service. No, no service hurt. never hurts anybody. Never hurts they may, if you give your half of, you give your, your just half of what you want, you'll get it. I mean, I don't think, you know, like I said, when I, when I got to be, I was, I was a chief hospital corpsman, and one morning, and that afternoon, I was an ensign, you know, and, that, you know, all, and nobody ever stood in the way of stopping me from doing anything. I can have all the education you want. And I tell, that's what I tell people, go in the military, it's not going to hurt you. Four years, three years, get out, and you got your GI Bill, then I said, nothing more, it'll mature you to learn how to be responsible for yourself. And that's the key. Oh, yeah. You know, you're responsible for yourself, not so, you know, and you learn teamwork and everything else. Well, thank you. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. Glad to do it.